you, folks. Welcome back to Dom Avenue. This is Chris once again. Hey folks, welcome back to Chris Wine Africa here on the Night Owls edition, the 22nd of June, 2021. Pleasure to have you back with us on this Night Owl stream. Hey, let's get uh, to the Indaba Africa news of the day, which we couldn't get to earlier because my guest was Dean Chansey, the Texan who loves to sing about South Africa, who's currently in South Africa. Dean was on earlier and a special cameo appearance by none other than Giselle on the stream. It was an awesome stream. Hope you had a chance to watch it. If you didn't, go back and do it. By the way, for those who are wondering, there was in fact um, some mischief by the Pooh Tube when uh, Dean mentioned um, the pandemic. He used the, the forbidden phrase apparently when he said that everyone's stream went into a buffering, including my own. The stream was still going out live, but that moment he said that for 30 seconds, people got buffered. So yeah, the poo tube is playing the game, no doubt. Anyway, folks, let's get right to it. I've left the chat on, which I don't normally do for the news, but I've left it on since it's Night Owls. And um, I, I know that most people here for Night Owls, not for the news. So let's get straight to the headlines for today. June 22nd, 2021. The Haltang Provincial Command Council was supposed to meet today, the 22nd of June, to recommend more ways to steal your liberty. On Thursday, there will be a national meeting in South Africa also looking at stealing your liberty by increasing the lockdown to level four or level five. So get ready for it, folks. If you haven't got your booze and smokes, you better run out and stock up right now. And if you're short on food and other necessities, I recommend you get out and get it before the fascist take away your liberty and imprison you for simply walking around. What a crime that is. The Port Elizabeth water crisis is finally getting some ink in the media, something I've talked about for well over a year since I started streaming on this channel. The Cougar Dam, which is the main source, the main reservoir for the city of Port Elizabeth or Nelson Mandela Bay metro area, also known as <laughs> Berna, is currently at 3.98% of capacity. Frighteningly low level of water, folks. I'm sure that it's probably evaporating faster than it can be recharged at this point. Selfish Teachers Union in South Africa calls for illiterate youth. Not really. They just don't want school open. They're perfectly fine not educating South Africa's kids. South Africa will host the first ever intellectual property theft racket in Africa, courtesy of the World Health Organization and captured Dr. Tedros. The two accused in the murder case of young farm manager Brendan Horner are seeking bail after DNA results on the blood on their clothing didn't match. The alleged Afrikaans ban in the dormitories at Stellenbosch seems to be going nowhere, the investigation into it, the inquiry into it. If you've got 27 and a half million rand to spare, well, I've got a three-story house for you in Bishop's Court near Cape Town. A record maize harvest in Zimbabwe is masking the actual situation on the ground in Zimbabwe. Senegal's President Macky Sall has joined Nigeria's President Buhari in an anti-tech, social tech, approach. And the Philippines unbalanced president Duterte, the guy who picked a fight with Obama, threatens jail to the unvaccinated. Google faces an European Union antitrust probe over its ad abuses. And UEFA tells Munich to get stuffed and no political nonsense at their matches. Racist hate-mongering Seattle Pride organizers ignore the irony of their bigotry. And another leftist woke tart exposed Billie Eilish and her Asian hatred. <laughs> Those are the headlines today, the 22nd of June, 2021. Let's get right into in-depth analysis on these stories, folks. The first is that the government of South Africa is contemplating seriously further increasing the lockdown because we know how effective it's not been for the past 18 months in South Africa. The government, which endlessly pats itself on the bat for a job well done has been an abject failure in every aspect in its response to the pandemic, whether it's economic policy or it is security or it is actual medical emergency that has been before the government. A useless, feckless response across the board in every aspect. The African National Congress should be prosecuted for their failures. They have likely caused the death of untold South Africans because of their ineffectual and criminal actions in many cases. Government officials will meet with scientific advisors. I love how they meet with scientific advisors. I, who are these scientific advisors? Are they throwing the bones? Are they Sangomas? 
and medical experts this week to discuss the possibility of introducing further restrictions in South Africa, because we know it worked so well the last time, not, as the third wave hits. Haltang's Provincial Command Council will meet on Tuesday, that's today, with the meeting set to focus on the possibility of recommending severe restrictions similar to what was imposed under Level 4, Level 5. Here's a prediction, ladies and gentlemen. On Thursday, the government will trot out, you know, the buffoon in charge, um, Ramaphosa. He'll come out Thursday or Friday and announce additional measures, but he'll call it level three adjusted or something like that. So they'll steal your liberty, but they'll pretend that you're still living under level three, but really push you to four and five with some of these restrictions. We know that their levels mean jack squat to them as they've done this the entire time. So be prepared for that on Thursday nationwide. A national meeting is set to be held Thursday where these and other recommendations will be tabled. South Africa moved to level three on June 15th, introducing further restrictions around gatherings, the sale of alcohol, and a tighter curfew. Port Elizabeth, Nelson Mandela Bay Metro, is experiencing a severe, experiencing a severe water crisis, which has been going on for several years. Gets virtually no ink. Of course, the mother city of Cape Town got one because it was a perfect opportunity for the climate zealots, those with the religion of climate change, to claim that Cape Town was suffering because of emissions from the developed north. Utter nonsense. Climate change may have played a small tangential role in what happened in Cape Town, but poor water management and a population 10 times the size it was a century ago are the reasons why Cape Town had no water. Cape Town has since recharged its reservoirs and is no longer suffering the water crisis that it had just a few years ago. But Port Elizabeth has had this crisis ongoing for a long time. It's not getting the rainfall and its poor water management is also part of the problem. The main dam supplying Port Elizabeth has less than 4% of current capacity. Water crisis Nelson Mandela Bay heads for a dry July as dam levels reach record lows. With water levels in Nelson Mandela Bay's biggest dam dropping under 4%, no significant rain predicted for the next 10 days, parts of the Eastern Cape's biggest metro are fast heading for a water disaster. 11 0.17% of water is left for consumption amongst all the reservoirs. The Nelson Mandela Bay's largest supply dam, the Kuga Dam, dropped to a historic low of 3.98% capacity in the past week. The Impofu Dam was at 16.64% of capacity, Rindal at 25.25, and Churchill at 19.55. It's been predicted that parts of the metro that rely solely on supply from the Kuga Dam will run out of reticulated water by July. The area will be hardest hit is Kwa Zakele, and the metro is constructing an emergency pipeline to restore access to reticulated water should the worst case scenario occur. This is a pending looming disaster for Nelson Mandela Bay. Where is the African National Congress? Where's the national government? What have they been doing when they arrested back control of the metro from the DA? What are they doing? What's going on at the national level to ensure that water gets here? Perhaps from the Highlands Water Project in Lesotho. Why not? What about desalinization? What's been going on? Well, South Africa has become a designated first country in Africa for the theft of intellectual property. As the World Health Organization, the Capture World Health Organization, under Dr. Tedos, Tedos, Dudus, Tedros, is sanctioning or authorizing South Africa to be the place where intellectual property theft occurs. South Africa, which has had every opportunity, like every country in the world, to develop vaccine for 18 months, sat on its ample bum and did nothing. Did nothing. Contributed zero to find a solution, relying on the research dollars of shareholders in the West, in the United States in particular, to develop the vaccines. 18 months, they still have not undertaken any effort at all to develop vaccine, pleading vaccine apartheid and putting their hand out and begging, please, mon sip, this pathetic excuse for governance that is the African National Congress. South Africa has chosen to host the first World Health Organization RNA vaccine technology transfer. That's not transfer, that's theft. But only a generous transfer of surplus vaccines from the rich north to the poor south can prevent an immediate catastrophe, Dr. Tedros's captured organization claims. It will be established by South African consortium consists comprising of companies BioVac, Afrogen Biologics, and Vaccines and a network of universities partnering with the World Health Organization, the Africa Center for Disease Control. So, this consortium was chosen from a list of about 20 companies or consortiums which wanted to receive the technologies. So these companies refused to do the research, refused to do the legwork, sat back waiting for the beggar-in-chief, Sir Ramaphosa, to claim vaccine apartheid. In a further development in the horrific, brutal torture and murder of young Brendan Horner, just turned 21, celebrating first anniversary as a farm manager, not even a farm owner, tortured and murdered. The two suspects in the case are now seeking bail because the DNA found on their clothing, the blood, does not match that of Brendan Horner. But the state doesn't want to release them in an interesting development. Senegal pair accused of murdering farm manager to apply for bail. 
members of the farming community from all over the country descend upon Senegal the first day of the court appearance of Mahalama and Maletza. That's the story from last October, but this is a story being published today. The two men accused of the murder of 21-year-old Brendan Horner are expected to apply for bail in the Senegal Magistrates Court today. Malamba, 32, and 44-year-old Malaleitsa allegedly stag- strangled and stabbed Horner and left his body tied to the bottom of a pole, sending a message. But the DNA found on the clothing, the bullet clothing in the head, does not match. The Free State National Prosecuting Authority spokesman Paladi Shuping says... This is after they were denied bail by the same court in October last year. The National Prosecuting Authority intends to oppose their release on bail because we are still maintaining that it is not in the interest of justice for the accused to be released on bail. Well, I find that interesting. What I also find curious is with a national crime lab that cannot process DNA, how do they have DNA results in this case? Was there political pressure? And beyond that, do you have other evidence? You must have evidence to keep them incarcerated. If, in fact, they are the ones responsible for the torture and murder, the racially motivated, racially, racially motivated torture and murder of Brendan Hormer, who is not a farm owner. He owned no land. He was murdered because he's white by racist scumbag bigots in South Africa. If you have evidence that they did it, well, then I'm okay with retaining them in prison for pending the court case. But I am curious about what's going on. This is a very strange situation in which there were claims that the police were involved in this because there are claims that police were involved in cattle rustling. Very curious situation indeed. This situation warrants an independent investigation by an outside authority. Just saying. Very bizarre situation here. Justice for Brendan Horner is not coming anytime soon, sadly. And this alleged situation at Stellenbosch University, which is disgraceful to begin with. First off, the, the land for Stellenbosch exists only granted in perpetuity on the basis that the medium of instruction would always be Afrikaans to protect the Afrikaans language. It was the only Afrikaans left institution in South Africa, yet we find students who come there and make ridiculous demands that the, the, the medium instruction be English, so the school caves and doesn't. Now there's an investigation into students whose first language is Afrikaans, which is the majority of the Western Cape, by a wide margin amongst coloreds and the white population, that they can't speak Afrikaans in the dormitories. What the hell is going on in South Africa? Bigotry and racism. And I have here a ridiculous article by President Sir Ramaphosa, an opinion article published on the 20th, which I'm going to do a video about, in which he talks about South Africa's, and South Africans, we have come to appreciate the strength of diversity. No, you haven't. You hate minorities. The culture of tolerance, you have no tolerance whatsoever. Anyone that criticizes you is a racist. That's ludicrous. And respect for others underpins our democracy. Bullshit doesn't underpin your democracy. This is lofty bullshit language that might have had some applicability briefly in the Rainbow Nation concept when Mandela first came on the stage. But today in 2021, they're just a tissue of lies, Sir Ramaphosa. Tissue of lies. But back to Afrikaans and Stellenbosch. Lost in mistranslation probe into alleged ban on Afrikaans at Métis residence. Notice how it's alleged. Whenever a minority South African is accused of a misdeed, it's racism. Eben Etzebeth's racism, he assaulted someone. No, 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 no. It's alleged, and it turned out to be total bullshit, which is what we said it was. But notice when Afrikaans is under assault, it's alleged. It's not alleged. There are statements from numerous students who've been saying that they've been prohibited from using their first language. It's ludicrous. Of course, the captured South African Human Rights Commission is involved, so obviously this investigation will go nowhere. Deep-seated language issues at Stellenbosch. There's no deep-seated. It's an Afrikaans institution. Stop the nonsense. No cosa. No English. Go back to Afrikaans only. Deep-seated language issues at Stellenbosch are popping up uh, again as the South African Human Rights Commission continues to probe into allegations that Afrikaans in some residences has been prohibited. Last week's hearings were marked by vastly contrasting testimonies. So nothing's going to happen. Bigotry and racism against Afrikaans-speaking South Africans, white and colored, will continue at the very institution that's supposed to enshrine and protect the language at the post-secondary, at the tertiary level education. What a joke. What a joke. Well, if you've got 27.5 million rand, I've got a place for you. Three-story house in Bishop's Court. Lovely residence. Thought we put something lighthearted into the news this evening. There you go. Hot property. Check that out, folks. 27 and a half million rand. Ooh, what's with the star at the bottom of the pool? I can see the little sa- the salger that goes along there in the pool, the pool cleaners. 
Situated in a secure enclave with 24-hour monitored security, he <laughs> many crew serve weapons too. This three-level, this three-level family house has five bedrooms, multiple indoor, outdoor living areas, and a pool, entertainment room, and terrace. Additional features include a fitted bar, a study, a gym, and a wine cellar. The spacious master suite occupies the entire second level. Now you're talking. That's what I'm talking about. One bedroom on an entire floor. Yeah, sign me up. Who wants to give me super chats? The purple pixie 33 just subscribed. Thank you for that, Purple Pixie. Do appreciate your patronage of the channel. Thank you very much for that. Um, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, I could get down with that. An entire floor of the residence is one bedroom. Mm, that's nice. A dressing room, his and her bathrooms, and a rooftop terrace with views. Well, anyone want to give me some super chats to start my down payment on that 27.5 million Rand house? <laughs> Seif Properties has it. And here's another one, a little bit cheaper for those of you um, living a little bit uh, more modestly in Constantia, Cape Town. Just under 20 million Rand. This is by Lou Geffen, Sotheby's International. This newly built home is set on 2,000 square meters, stand amid landscape gardens with abundant mountain views. There's four ensuite bedrooms and four reception rooms that flow through glass stacking doors to large undercover patios and terraces. Other features include a separate study, downstairs guest cloakroom, pajama lounge. Whoa! Annette Funicello will be popping in for the pajama lounge <laughs> with fireplace and a floating staircase with an atrium. What the heck is a floating staircase? Is it like water-based? <laughs> and an atrium glass roof. Well, sign me up for that one, folks. At just under 20 million, I actually prefer that one. That's pretty cool. I could have guests over, run it as a B&B. &B, you know, pretty cool stuff. Zimbabwe has a record maize harvest. Are we celebrating? No, because it masks the reality. The only reason there's a record harvest is because record amount of land has been put to the still for the maize crop, including marginal land. And decent rainfall has led to a record crop, but yields are abysmal. Why? Because of communal farming. That's why. Commercial farmers got the maximum yields out of the least amount of land and fed Zimbabwe and the region. But turning land over under lease tenant to black Zimbabweans has not improved the economy or agriculture. Forecast to reap biggest maize crop in almost four decades, but yields remain dismal. The U.S. Department of Agriculture said in a brief report that Zimbabwe's corn crop, or maize, for 21-22 marketing year is estimated 2.7 million tons, an increase of almost 200% from the 907 produced just the year prior. The U.S. Department of Agriculture went on to say that this will be Zimbabwe's biggest maize crop since 1984-85. Almost four decades. It attributed this to an expansion in area and favorable weather conditions. As a result, the Zimbabwean government terminated the lease, the issuing of import permits for corn and cornmeal to local grain millers as supply exceeds local demand. Zimbabwe also, for the first time in three years, managed to maintain the minimum strategic grain reserve of half a million tons in fiscal stocks. Well, why does an economy have to ban imports? That's ridiculous. That's a command economy. No wonder Zimbabwe is a disaster. The reality is that these farmers are inefficient and ineffective. And that's not the farmer's fault. It's small-scale plots. It's not commercial farming, which makes maximum use of labor, resources, inputs, and harvest. And the people running Zimbabwe are thieving idiots. And that's why the country is in this situation. Until Zimbabweans take control of their country, we'll continue to see the misery and continue to see the exodus out of Zimbabwe by anybody who can get out. Senegal's Mackie Sale has joined the chorus against Twitter and Facebook, joining President Buhari from Nigeria. It's now my turn, social media. <laughs> now that Mackie Sale has created a new call for new legislation to give the Senegalese government greater control of social media, internet users are suffering the consequences. Oh, please. He's called for it. No one's being censored. This is a lying, this is disgraceful, Damien. Glees from the Africa Report, a Jeune Afrique subsidiary. No one's suffering. Oh, gee, many crickets. Gee, many crickets. In Senegal, where social media sites play a pivotal role in ensuring transparency of elections, President Macky Sall in May began criticizing people who hide behind their keyboards to gratuitously destroy the reputation of individuals. Well, Macky Sall has a point. The tech titans allow the abuse of people on the center and right and they do nothing about the abuses and the horrific things that appear on their platforms, especially Twitter. Switching to Asia, the Philippines' uh, unbalanced president, Duterte, the gentleman who got in a spat with Obama, if you remember that famously, <laughs> who was cheered by many centrists and conservatives, but at the time I said, this dude's a little unbalanced. Well, he remains unbalanced. He's threatening Filipinos with imprisonment if they're not vaccinated. President Rodrigo Duterte threatened to jail people who refused to be vaccinated against the, uh, against the pandemic as the Philippines battles one of Asia's worst outbreaks. You choose 
vaccine or I'll have you jailed, he said in a televised address on Monday following reports of low turnouts at several sites in Manila. Don't get me wrong, there's a crisis in this country. I'm just exasperated by Filipinos not heeding the government. Well, screw you. Who the hell are you? Are you an epidemiologist? Are you a virologist? Are you a medical practitioner? No, you are just some clown who got elected. <laughs> and, and your bureaucracy is not exactly effective. Otherwise, the Philippines with 70 million people or 110 million people would be a burgeoning, burgeoning economy with all the resources at its disposal. But it's not. So that tells us everything we need to know about listening to the government in the Philippines. Google facing an antitrust lawsuit from the European Union. Perhaps it's about time. Alleged ad tech abuses. The European Union opened a formal antitrust investigation into allegations of Google abuses abuses its leading role in advertising technology sector, the most wide-ranging case yet to look at the pillar of the tech giant's business. Some of the EU's investigation will also cover similar ground to a case filed last year against Google by a group of U.S. states led by Texas. Similar areas include Google's allegedly favoring its own ad buying tools in the advertising auction it runs. But the, also probe, the probe will also cover complaints that haven't yet been subject to formal inquiries anywhere, including Google's alleged exclusion of competitors from brokering ad buys on Google-owned site YouTube. Well, it's a bit complicated unless you're a lawyer, but the bottom line is this. Google's accused of unfair practices. Hardly a shocker. And this, we're going to play a little bit of video. This is from Deutsche Welle, the German site, about UEFA, the European Football Union, and its response to Munich's request to light up the Allianz Arena with rainbow colors. Something it's done in the past, but not during UEFA sponsored match. And that is some controversy because organizers of the European Football Championships have refused an application by Munich City Council to have its stadium illuminated in rainbow colors for Germany's final group game against Hungary. The sports governing body, UEFA, says that it was declining the request because of its political content. The Munich mayor, Dieter Reiter's application, made clear it was meant to protest a new Hungarian law that prohibits the sharing of content portraying homosexuality or sex reassignment with children. Human rights groups have described it as anti-LGBTQ discrimination. So UEFA doesn't want to let Munich throw mud in the eye of the country of Hungary because Hungary is playing at the arena. Hungary has a law which forbids the vulnerable minors from being introduced to these topics. And their bigotry in Munich, shame on Munich, shame on Munich, shame on Munich, um, attacking a state for protecting minors. But soccer is a captured sport anyway. We've seen all this nonsense, you know, they're, they're pandering and virtue signaling for years against racism when most of the high played payers in many of these countries are people who are minorities or people of color. It's utter nonsense. But congratulations to UEFA for doing something proper for once. In Seattle, the bigotry, the irony of the bigotry and racism on display here by a pride organizing group is just beyond the pale. And Seattle has no problem with it. Seattle Commission dismisses complaint about pride event charging white people reparations fee. The commission told the complainant to educate yourself on the harm it may cause Seattle's BIPOC, whatever the hell that is, community, in your pursuit of a free ticket. One more acronym after another. The Seattle Human Rights Commission dismissed concerns about a pride event that will charge white entrants a reparations fee, telling complainants that they should educate themselves on the harm they might cause by attending. What? Talk about racist. The very statement itself is racist. We would like to recommend, if possible, that you educate yourself on the harm it may cause Seattle's BIPOC community in your pursuit of a free ticket to an event that is not expressly meant for you or your entertainment, the commission said in a letter to Charlotte Lefebvre and Peter Lipson of Capitol Hill Pride. Lefebvre and Lipson had reported argued to the commission that the 26th June event constituted reverse discrimination. Well, discrimination, discrimination. The June 26th event is described on Facebook as a black and brown, queer, trans centered, prioritized, valued event. The Facebook page adds white allies and accomplices. <laughs> accomplices. Oh, my God. You don't see the irony of the bigoted, hateful message you say there. Wow. The 26th June event is described on Facebook as a black and brown, queer, trans-centered, prioritized, valued event. The Facebook page adds white allies and accomplices. Accomplices are welcome to attend, but we charge $10 to $50 reparations fee that will be used to keep the event free of cost for black and brown, trans, and queer community. So, there's no equality before the law. You expect superiority. Superiority. That's what you want. Not equality. 
There's no equality here. There's no equal protection here. You are expecting people who appear different to pay for others. You freaking morons. Oh my God. Oh my God. Unbelievable. Oh, I said God. I'm sure that probably offends some of you idiots. Well, another leftist woke tard, entertainer, performer, celebrity has been exposed for anti-Asian hatred. <laughs> it just keeps coming. They just keep coming. You notice it is the conservatives who have these hidden videos and say evil things. Now, they try to take things conservatives say and they edit it and play around with it. But you never find conservatives coming out and saying these vile and disgusting things about groups it's always, it's always the woke tard leftist. That's who it is. <laughs> Billie Eilish apologizes for resurfaced video in which she mouths racial slur. She denies mocking Asian people. A resurfaced TikTok video, and TikTok hasn't been around that long, so it's not that ancient Billie Eilish, called for the bad guy singer to be canceled. She's breaking her silence after being accused of mocking Asian people in a recently resurfaced video on TikTok. An undated video of Eilish in which the bad guy singer allegedly mocked an Asian's accent. In another clip, Eilish appears to say the ethnic slur C with a K at the end, referring to someone of Chinese. Oh, I just figured out what that slur is. It took me a moment. I'm a little slow on that. I love you guys, and many of you have been asking me to address this, and this is something I want to address because I'm being labeled something that I'm not. There's a video edit going around of me when I was 13 or 14 where I mouthed a word from a song that at the time I didn't know was a derogatory term used against members of the Asian community. I'm appalled, embarrassed, and want to barf that I ever mouth along to that word. Well, if you're 13 or 14, Billie Eilish, and you are not aware of derogatory terms, then perhaps your credibility is a little bit strained. If you're 11 or 12, I'd buy the story. But 13 or 14, I'm not really buying that you were... This song was the only time I'd ever heard that word as it was never used around me by anyone in my family. Regardless of my ignorance and age at the time, nothing excused the fact that it was hurtful. And for that, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I don't use the N-word. I know that. I've never used it. Hey, so why is it that conservatives are aware of bad things? Now, it's funny because some words get twisted around. The word that she's talking about has been a racial slur against Asians from China my entire life. That's 50 plus years. So she has no excuse. No excuse. I never used the word, but I know what it is. And I know it's derogatory. How could she not know at the age of 14? Anyway, hmm. there you have it, folks. That's the news and headlines from today, the 22nd of June, 2021.